It's over 9,000! Welcome, Super Elite Warriors, to Final Forum, a podcast for the discussion of all things Dragon Ball. I am your host, Jelly, an elite recruiting member of the Frieza Force on a mission to find the best warriors from across the galaxy to join the greatest army of all time, and I am joined, as always, by my new recruit co-host. This is the bikini. Listen, can we get out of here? All this greenery. I I prefer a more technological planet. Ah, like Planet M2 from Dragon Ball GT. Ugh, I mean... Yes, but, like, can we not acknowledge GT? Hey, listen, I can't help it if you're the number one GT super fan and wish you could live on the planets from the show. I was actually thinking of the big Getty star from Return of Cooler. I guess I can't help it if you're the number one GT super fan whose mind immediately went there. I am dumb enough to have recently purchased all of GT. That's not the only thing you're dumb enough to do. Oh, really? Really? Like, what else? And before you answer that, keep in mind, I haven't seen any way stations or landing beacons anywhere around us, if this planet even has any. What do you wager your odds would be of finding one of those before a giant horde of ants finds you? Listen, we could sit here all day and bicker and argue about who likes what inferior product more. Sounds suspiciously like dodging the question. Well, hang on. Hang on. Like I was saying, we could sit around and bicker and argue, and we've done that in the past, and that was dumb. Sounds like you're calling me dumb. Let me finish. Let me finish. That was dumb because it wasted precious time that Lord Frieza values when searching for new warriors. Huh. Well, you made me waste that time, so you're the dumb one. But you're my commander, so really it seems like it's your fault. Hmm. Point taken. Lord Frieza would have my head if he knew how much valuable time I allow you to waste. Right, plus you never even let me finish my thought. I'm surprised you even have thoughts, but go on, let's hear the rest. Well, we could waste our time arguing, or we could fire up the long-range scouter and get our next bearing. Sounds like a plan to me. Fire up the long-range systems and get me a couple different potential targets. Aye, aye. And while we're scouring this quadrant of the galaxy for new fighters, let's dive into this week's topic. And this week we're talking about episodes 83 through 86 of Dragon Ball, which is getting us into the Tian Shinhan saga, or the 22nd Budokai Tenkaichi. That's right. And we're going to start off this week with episode 83, entitled Which Way to Papaya Island? So at this point we're gearing up for a new tournament. Uh, We open on a sprawling vista with an eagle flying by very majestically. Uh, We learn it's been three years since Goku first left to train on his own in the world. His training today, however, interrupted by a car chase. We have a green fox person who's being chased by a tiger, an ape, and a boar. The three start walloping on him once they catch him, but Goku intervenes and saves him. We get our first look at Goku, who's clearly grown at least a little bit during these three years. His his proportions have shifted slightly. Uh, He makes quick work of the thugs, and um, the fox kid thanks him, and we learn that his name is Konkichi. He offers a ride and all the canned food his bro can eat as thanks for saving him. Konkichi is, we find out, taking Goku to the local airport under the assumption that Goku was obviously going to fly from there to get to the tournament, because it's turns out it's the day after tomorrow, and 
any normal person would assume that flying is really the only way to make it in time. Goku mentions running, but the kid kind of just writes it off like, oh, that's that's a great joke. But there's a couple other like fish out of water scenes, like when they get to the airport and like learning about the the plane tickets and how much they're going to cost. Ultimately, Kankichi like promises to help Goku catch a plane. And his initial plan is to turn to like pitpocketing, like he steals from a wealthy traveler who already has tickets to Papaya Island. But then he almost immediately runs into a security officer, decides eh, this might be a little bit too risky, and then just like hands over the tickets like, oh, hey, I found these. You should totally return them to whoever there is missing them. He then like immediately grabs Goku and they dart out of the airport and he starts to drive him into the town proper to look for an opportunity to raise money for two tickets now at this point because he's decided he's going to go with Goku and they have a time limit of about an hour and a half i think it's like 3 or 3:30 or something like that is when the plane's supposed to take off uh fortunately for them there's a carnival in town and they decide to hustle the strongman game which is where you know you hit the thing with the hammer and the thing pops up and hits the bell i've learned today that that is called a strongman game hmm don't feel too badly about them because they were cheating anyways, and so they just used Goku's strength to sort of overcome the handicap and, and win fairly, if you were to look at it that way. <laughs> so with cash in hand, our boys intend to head back to the airport and buy tickets to Papaya Island, but they run into one of Goku's friends, fortune teller Baba. They recap events from the beginning of the episode, and Baba starts asking some very pointed questions of our new friend. Kikichi doesn't like this turn of events and runs off to buy a drink. While on his own, he debates whether he should split with the prize money, but instead he gets ambushed by the three thugs from earlier. Turns out, Kankichi owes them money, and the prize money that he won at the carnival is not going to be enough to cover it. So they decide to give him a job instead. And at this point, we kind of like jump over to Kame House for a little bit to catch up with uh, what the boys are doing training under Roshi. We cut back to um, Yahoi, which is the name of the, the, the city in this town. I forgot to mention that earlier. But it's almost like 2.30, so like the plane's getting close to, to like boarding and taking off, and there's been no sign of Kankichi for a while. So Baba's like, hey, maybe you should probably go look for your friend. I, I have a feeling that it probably shouldn't be taking this long for him to come back with a drink. And before he can even get out of the car, he hear like multiple gunshots, cries of bank robbery going down. Like the police show up, and it looks like the obvious culprit is Kankichi. But he claims he didn't do it. It was the one-armed man. I mean, the three guys from earlier. <laughs> Luckily, Bob was willing to clue Goku in as to their whereabouts, and they now have a Goku missile chasing them down. The action's depressingly short because these guys are jokes, really, at the end of the day. But Goku saves the day, the real bad guys are turned in, Kankichi's set free, and Goku decides to swim to Papaya Island because he missed his plane. That brings us to episode 84, titled Rivals and Arrivals. Uh, we start this episode with everyone making their way to Papaya Island. Everyone's arriving at slightly different times, but they're sort of like catching up with each other as they all meet. The Kame crew arrive by plane. Roshi drops a figurative bomb on Papaya Island. The Kame crew arrive for registration and find that Goku is not there yet. But we see, as as viewers, that he's actually making his way there in new Tiger Stripe Duds. Roshi uses the break in narrative to enter himself again as Jackie Chun. Uh, as Roshi rejoins the group, we are officially introduced to the Crane Hermit and his students. An old man pissing contest ensues. The other members of the Kame crew ask Roshi for some backstory. Crane is Roshi's rival and has been for a long time. But forget that right now. There's only one minute left for Goku to register. <laughs> There's this really jarring cut where they're like, you think you're going to get Crane's backstory, and then they go back to worrying about Goku. But good thing he's there. The sequence of events has been really convenient. <laughs> <laughs> Goku explains he was late since he had to swim all the way there, and everyone's shocked. I don't know why. This kid, every time he shows up, has some ridiculous story that they don't believe yet is somehow true. Now that everyone's here, it's basically time to chow down in preparation for the tournament tomorrow. Unfortunately, Roshi has no money, even though he was the one that offered to pay. Uh, so he begs to have his bill put on a tab until the end of the tournament. Hmm, I wonder what's going on there. The crew goes back to the hotel to play some cards and relax. The girls go to bed, and of course, Roshi has to be gross and gets a black eye and a bloody nose for his trouble. During the night, Krillin sneaks out to get a little warm-up in before the fighting starts and is shortly joined by Yamcha. They think they're, you know, they've got this feeling, oh, we're the only ones that are really kind of taking this seriously, but it turns out that they've actually just now caught up to about like half a dozen other fighters who've also had the same idea. Fighters gear up for the prelims in the morning. Roshi dons his familiar disguise and silently gloats to himself about his own training in hopes of keeping ahead of Goku. And we end the episode with Goku eating the largest rice ball I have ever seen. That brings us to episode 85, which is titled Preliminary Peril. The sun rises on the 22nd Tenkaichi Budokai, 
who will be crowned strongest under the heavens this time? But before we can worry about the final, first our heroes have to make it through the preliminaries. Everyone participates in the traditional drawing of their lot to be placed in different blocks for the prelims, and as luck would have it, all four of our friendly fighters end up in different blocks, meaning they won't have to face off until they reach the final eight. Yamcha wins his first match handily. Krillin takes on a dollar store Andre the Giant and throws him from the ring. Those two boys are pleased with their progress, but the Crane students seem unimpressed. The Crane students attempt, attempt to flex on the Turtle students, but Jackie Chun steps in to defuse the situation. He's going to do this a few times before we actually get to the tournament proper, but uh, he's trying to keep it cool so that they can actually compete and not be disqualified. Crane Hermit harasses the girls, and I'm starting to wonder if being a pervert grants superpowers in this universe because – they're both – both he and Roshi are terrible, and yet for some reason are martial arts masters. <laughs> Tien takes on a sumo wrestler in the prelims. He wins basically without even trying. The next up is Goku. He will be facing off against the feared Chapa O, oh, former champion who previously took the tournament and became champion without ever being touched. Surely Goku can defeat him, right? Well, we won't know until we watch the next episode, which is episode 86, Then There Were Eight. This episode opens with a quick recap of the finished prelim matches and a reminder that Goku's about to face off against a strong opponent. Uh, the match starts off with the expected posturing and lookers on wondering how much Goku has grown. Uh, but what follows is just full on embarrassing for Chapa O. Oh. Jackie Chun's now worried about his title of champion after seeing Goku's performance, but the handling of his opponent while completely distracted leaves many wondering why he should be worried in the first place. After the initial round is complete, we get a nice 80s montage of the rest of the preliminaries followed by lunch. Uh, the meal, not the person, and a brief <laughs> interlude of the rest of the crew playing carnival games. Then we get a surprise visit from Nam, who it turns out is also entered into the tournament. So with the prelims finally concluded, we have our final lineup of the grand tournament. We have Goku, Krillin, Yamcha, Jackie Chun, Tien, who knocks Nam out of the tournament and does so in a fashion that kind of upsets the turtle students. Uh, Chaozu, and at this point, two mystery fighters all proceed to the final rounds. The Turtle School also has a bone to pick over Nam's treatment and Tien's overall attitude this entire time. As the tournament approaches, lunch kicks off a mass shooting event to get better seats, and the stage is set for another fantastic Tenkaichi Budokai. Speaking of lunch, because I don't, I don't know if I had it in our notes here, and I do want to mention this. The episode, and I can't remember now if it's episode 83 or 84, but it's the one that shows the turtle crew on the plane on their way to papaya island is one of those ones that had some 911 editing uh, oh really were, these th dragon ball sh premiered on tv for the first time in i think 2000 and so then ran into 2001 and 2002 and i think this episode aired in early 2002 in the subtitles or the japanese rather i would i would imagine the subtitles have probably also been edited but in the original japanese when when launch is like complaining that she wants to get off the plane and is really uncomfortable like she's like sitting there like don't you just hate being on planes she actually <laughs> is sitting there because this is remember evil robber launch She's sitting there going, oh, every time you're on a plane, don't you want to just hijack it? <laughs> <laughs> Which in like 1985 or 87, actually, when this was when this came out, was a much more acceptable joke. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I could see that. <laughs> but not so much in early 2002. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> so... <laughs> So let's let's dial it back though to those first couple episodes and talk right away about this time skip where we go from episode 82 was Inashikacho to now it's 3 years later. This is the first time we have a time skip in Dragon Ball, but it's going to be far from the last. And it almost though didn't happen at all. Shonen Jump stories are supposed to be about young children and they're supposed to stay young children for the entirety of the run. For the benefit of that target audience of, of young boys. Toriyama becomes among the earliest to break this tradition, along with Mazinger Z, Do Your Best Genki, and Fist of the North Star being the only other ones who had done it before him. Torishima was worried fans wouldn't like it, and he didn't want Toriyama to do it. His theory, Torishima's theory, 
and his approach to manga in general is that a character's initial impression is the basis of their appeal. And if you change that, you lose what fans connected to in the first place. So this could explain, you know, when some people are like, oh, Vegeta's been a good guy for a while and then all of a sudden he's bad again. And like some of that stuff, that might be Torishima kind of pushing Toriyama to be a little bit like, hey, listen, fans fell in love with this dude as a villain and as a cocky braggart. Like, don't change that about him. Uh, It could also feed into a lot of like Goku's kind of flat character arc, right? Is that's Torishima's belief is if a fan really latches onto someone, you shouldn't change that because they loved that. Things, that makes sense to a degree, I think. It, it does, to a degree. And it's... I especially think when you consider the type of storytelling that was going on in Japan in the 60s and 70s, and then was only just starting to change in the early 80s, like, Ultraman's a pretty good example, because it was a really... It was, like, one of the most popular shows on television in Japan in the 60s and 70s. And that is very much, like... The hero always wins. Spoilies, like, very, very rarely is he shown as being anything other than a hero and being anything other than kind of perfect. Anytime you see something, like, there's this great bit in Ultraman in the first series, uh, Ultraman, where the character, the main character who turns into Ultraman, he uses a like a giant, they call it the beta capsule to do it. And it's basically like a giant hoi poi capsule. He has to push the button on it and that transforms him into Ultraman. There's a great bit in one of the early episodes, uh, or no, actually one of like the mid midway through where he's eating breakfast and he's having cereal and something happens and he runs out to go transform into Ultraman and he doesn't realize he's been holding his spoon this whole time. <laughs> And it's a fun joke, right? That's like just so, that's a funny little bit. They almost fired the director for doing that. Wow. So that's that's messed up. This was just it was the mindset, right? Is the audience likes the character as a thing. Don't deviate from that at all. Things eventually come to a head between Torishima and Toriyama, and Toriyama threatens to quit, stating he only even wanted to do Dragon Ball for 10 volumes anyways, and the Baba arc is at the end of the 10th volume. So Torishima backs off, and he's like, fine, do it. But he's so nervous that fans are going to hate it. He stayed in the Toei offices, or not the Toei, the Shonen Jump offices for the entirety of release day of this chapter, pacing around the phones, waiting for complaint calls that wound up never coming. We're starting to see Toriyama's art style shift more towards more angular. And he says, I love this, he says he gets some complaints and these just fuel him to lean into his new style even more. If his fans think the old way was better, he'll push further towards the new way because he loves to be a contrarian and make people mad. And it's interesting that this comes up because this was something that I had noticed in the episodes themselves. Uh, These and then the next for for next episode, it becomes even more pronounced. But we do start to see some of that. I call it like Z file. There's Z style fighting where it's more about like zipping around quickly, like rapid attacks and like close range, like parrying and things like that. Yeah. Getting back to the to the actual notes we have, as the story shifts off arcs again, we're shifting tone and style once again. Obviously, everything still retains the DNA that is Dragon Ball, uh, but the shift now is is in a genre known as Shenmo. Uh, Shenmo is a Chinese storytelling genre based around gods and demons clashing, monsters and immortals of Chinese mythology doing battle within a supernatural framework, but in our natural realm. A person can come into contact with a god or battle a demon while checking his mail. Humans fight demons to ascend to supernormal levels of strength in Shenmo. The genre dates back to the 14th century, though its popularity boomed around the middle of the 17th century up through the early 20th as it became more accessible and began emphasizing martial arts and humor. Uh, Journey to the West is a Shenmo story, and so Toriyama's manga is inexorably linked with the genre uh, at the outset. He wanted the manga to be even more accessible to outsiders as he stripped out the religious underpinnings. It's in the 22nd uh, Budokai Tenkaichi that we he really leans into it, but because he's Toriyama, he does so by like mashing things together. He's Japanese and he's raised in Japanese customs, so his ideas of deities 
are based on Japanese tradition and culture, not Chinese. But he's also a kung fu movie fan, so he unknowingly incorporates a lot of Chinese culture and mythology by virtue of wanting to mimic elements of the movies that he likes. On top of that, he's shown that much of his uh, dragon world is set in the West, uh, whether it be through Goku's fight against the Red Ribbon Army or the trips to West City. So he's throwing some Western flair in here too, ultimately creating something new, but that feels familiar and comfortable to everyone worldwide. It's paving new ground and creating something new while being accessible to everybody. On to Konkichi the Fox. Uh, so he's based on Dombe from Dr. Slump, and per interview with Derek Padula a while back, his speech patterns are based on those of a character from a 1960s black and white Japanese spy movie. We did a bunch of looking into what this movie could be and even skimmed through snippets of a few movies and found nothing like definitive because we just don't have the time, frankly. But it's possible that the movie in question is Drifting Detective Tragedy in the Red Valley. The movie's directed by Kinji Fukusaku in one of his earliest directorial efforts and stars a young Sonny Chiba. Fukusaku winds up becoming one of Japan's most prolific and influential filmmakers uh, with such credits as Battles Without Honor or Humanity, Graveyard of Honor, and Battle Royale to his name, as well as a tokusatsu flick called The Green Slime. And Sonny Chiba is obviously one of Japan's biggest stars, and Toriyama's known to be a huge fan. Uh, if this is inaccurate, we'll make sure we ultimately correct ourselves, but as of recording this episode, it's basically just our best guess. Uh, in any event, Konkichi is based off a movie Toriyama likes. We know at least that much. Battle Royale is awesome. It's a good movie. I like it. I've never seen Battles Without Honor or Humanity. That's probably a, a bad on me. <laughs> the Green Slime how, is... How dare you not know about niche Japanese cinema? <laughs> the Green Slime is is really a cool, tight little kaiju flick. Not kaiju, more tokusatsu. So it's like out in outer space and that's i love old like 50s and 60s and even some 70s outer space stuff when characters would put on helmets with like no face mask on them and that would protect them from space and stuff like (laughs) i just i I dig that kind of stuff it's just so Uh, it's so cheesy that it it works better than anything that's trying to be super realistic I think probably one of my favorite things to do with like old sci-fi film, not even like super old, like you could even go back to early 2000s really, but just like listening to some of the bad science in those movies (laughs) can be very entertaining. (laughs) So why does Goku wear a tiger skin loincloth in episode uh, 83? Because Sun Wukong did in Journey to the West. It's kind of just like a little small Easter egg. Uh, Further back than that, a tiger skin is often depicted as but being worn by Shiva, the destroyer. And Oni, which are malevolent ghosts of, of Japan, so be, uh, parallel would be like demons, essentially. Tigers represent male virility and skill through force. A tiger's skin is typically worn by wrathful warriors, but here it's on Goku because he's the opposite of that, so it's more Toriyama playing with opposites yet again. Uh, this is what the anime considers the end of the Baba arc, though if you were to ask us personally, it should probably have been the previous episode being the... At the end of the Baba arc. Yeah, right I mean, right before the time skip. Yeah, which would make sense. <laughs> so that's the end of the Baba arc, I guess, finally. We did forget to do this in our last episode, so I want to do it now and just say sure. very quickly, any final thoughts on that and final grades out of seven Dragon Balls? I'll give it five or six, I guess, depending on the day for final grade. There's a lot of really good self-contained stuff. We're starting to see some slightly higher production values in the animation. Uh, The animation itself is starting to move towards a style that's really going to define this series as it goes on. And then we get the the fun little story with with Baba's little kind of mini tournament and and, and some of the gaffes and jokes that they used to defeat some of her fighters, in my opinion, were actually pretty good. Uh, so yeah, I, I give it like a, a five or six depending on the day, but it, I, like if you had to do one score, it'd be like a 5.5. Five. I'm, I'm pretty right, right there. Like I, I give it a solid five, very solid five out of seven Dragon Balls, which would be a, like a three and a half edging towards a four out of, out of five. Uh, I think it's, it's just a strong, it's pretty tight. Like we did mention that there's a few fillery kind of feeling parts to it with some of the like intros and outros of episodes just feeling a little a little lengthy but i feel like once you get 
once you get into those 16 minutes of each episode that is the actual storytelling, it's like good stuff. And yeah. there's a lot of fun to be had in that. And there's not a lot of bad filler necessarily. So plus then also, yeah, the filler stuff that's at the very end is like the good filler. Like it's the good yeah. kind of stuff. So, so yeah, I'm at, I'm at a solid five out of seven Dragon Balls on Bo- fortune teller Baba. Now getting back to this, by the way, Durian airport on Papaya Island. These are two of the most god awful fruits in existence. <laughs> Durian, I was the same thing when I saw it too. Durian, you you might out there know is like the notoriously smelly food. It's banned from a lot of public places due to its odor. You're not allowed to eat it in like office buildings, on trains. You like basically, if you want to eat durian overseas, you bas- you just have to do it in your house. <laughs> <It's> like- <laughs> And even then, those people probably do it outside. <laughs> but it's said to have a sweet custardy flavor. I don't know about that. It's one of those things. Maybe it does, but I would imagine. I don't know what it smells like. I've heard it. I've heard it said it smells like rotting flesh. I've heard something similar. Yeah, I feel like that. Your sense of smell is so tied to your sense of taste. It would overpower your like taste receptors. You know, you would think. But apparently not. And then papaya has a pretty inoffensive odor. And I will say I don't mind the seeds on it. But a lot of people, myself included, say that the fruit, the flesh of a papaya, tastes like vomit. Gross. I found this recently. I tried it for like the first time in, you know, 15 years probably. There's an acid in it that's the same as an enzyme found in stump enzyme found in stomach bile. And the extent to which that like comes to the forefront for some people basically determines its flavors. For me, I see. For so me, it's, it's pa- kind of like cilantro. Some people think cilantro tastes sort of soapy. Yes. Yes. For me, I like cilantro. Papaya tastes like puke. Like that's the lingering taste that's left in my mouth after I eat papaya is as if I just threw up. <laughs> Welcome to my party. Would you like fruit that smells like <laughs> rotten flesh or puke? <laughs> getting getting into some of the preliminary stuff. Krillin's fight against Anton the Great. Anton the Great is essentially Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant, for those who don't know, was a professional wrestler and an actor, and he was billed as the eighth wonder of the world due to his tremendous size. He stood over seven feet tall. He weighed over 500 pounds. He was famously or infamously one of the biggest drinkers ever, being capable of drinking over 100 beers in single sittings. And this is witnessed by multiple people on multiple different occasions. He could drink a hundred beers. I I find that so hard to believe. But it's a gallon of beer. Or not a gallon. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. No. No. It's <laughs> ten gallons of beer. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but I don't know, they they say single sittings, but I think it's like, hey, we went you know when you go to like a a brewery at noon? Yeah. And then you close that place down. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Which starts to make a little more sense because I also have heard he would drink like a gallon of milk with dinner. Yeah, that's pretty. That's a lot. (laughs) So so for him to drink like 100 beers in a day. Yeah. Yeah, I could probably see that. But he was also famously one of the more generous people you could meet. His character... Throughout his time in WWE, which was then WWF, had his best run, though, as a, as a heel or a bad guy. He was the biggest and the strongest, so he was booked as this unbeatable monster, incapable of even being knocked down. In 1987, he had a long-running feud with Hulk Hogan at the height of Hulkamania, which, if you never watched wrestling, I feel like Hulkamania was so big, it, like seeped into every facet of pop culture. Yeah, brother. Uh, I mean, P- Hulkamania was so big, it was in Gremlins 2. 
Yes, it was. <laughs> um, and then, so Andre the Giant and Hulk Hogan have this big feud going on throughout like late 86 into early 87. And it culminates in WrestleMania 3, where the main event was Hogan versus Andre the Giant. And this culminated in the first time Andre the Giant was ever lifted and body slammed. And this was like the hugest thing in wrestling at the time. If you talk to longtime wrestling fans and say, what are some of the biggest moments just as individual moments in professional, professional wrestling, yeah. this will almost always be in the top 10. This was as big then as if you're, uh, my age, which, you know, like late thirties, probably early forties, maybe late twenties, that might be pushing it. But if you remember when Hulk Hogan turned heel and how big of a deal that was, Andre the Giant getting body slammed was that big of a deal in wrestling. So it aired, uh, WrestleMania 3 aired only a couple weeks after the manga chapter featuring Anton the Great was published. So even when it was being written, Andre was at the peak of his popularity. He's in a big feud with the biggest guy in wrestling. He's the top heel in the company, and they are promoting WrestleMania and building up to it already. Now, if you're not a wrestling fan, you should know Andre the Giant, I hope, from the movie The Princess Bride, which was actually also released in 1987, and that movie's amazing. Anybody want a peanut? <laughs> if, if for some reason you have not seen The Princess Bride, stop listening to this podcast. You are missing out on a, a central piece of cinema history right there. It's It's incredible. Stop listening to this right now. Go watch The Princess Bride and then come back. <laughs> Sadly, Andre the Giant passed away at the age of just 46 due to congestive heart failure, no doubt exacerbated by his acromegaly, which was gigantism. Goku's prelim opponent is Chapa O. Chapa O, we talked about, or we just briefly mentioned, wasn't even previously touched in his fight or his previous tournaments. He uses a technique that makes it appear as if he's got eight arms. In Hindu culture, like it's like he even calls it like my eight arm technique. In Hindu culture, beings with many arms are often depicted as deities who have ascended to great levels of cultivation, most notably Ganesha. So just kind of keep this in mind because multiple arm techniques may return later in this tournament. Now, this 22nd Budokai Tenkaichi, it focuses on light versus dark and shadow versus sun as symbols for choosing your path towards, you know, being a bad guy or a good guy. And kind of just keep that in mind as we're watching all of these episodes, you know, light versus dark. I, really keep in mind, as we go along, analogs for Star Wars characters... If you're like a if you're a big Star Wars fan and you're here in light versus dark, shadow versus sun, choosing your path, really keep that in mind because I think you're gonna see a pretty clear analog for Obi Wan Kenobi, Darth Vader, and Luke Skywalker. And I may have just spoiled it for you, but <laughs> I also don't think it's all that super surprising. But it's just kind of interesting to look at the parallels. Now, let's get into Crane Hermit, a.k.a. Suru Senen. Suru is obviously Crane, so he's the Crane Hermit, as Kame Senen is the Turtle Hermit. Appearance-wise, he looks a lot like Hideo Amamoto, who we mentioned on our Baba episode. We've mentioned a whole bunch of Amamoto films previously, but as we're closing in on Halloween, when this episode is going to be released, I'm going to throw another film onto that list and and mention the movie Quidon, which I'm not sure if I've mentioned in the past, but I'm mentioning it again now. This is a Japanese horror anthology film with like four vignettes. Each is about the length of a short film, and thus the whole movie is over three hours long. That's the bad news. The good news is because it's an anthology and there's not really a bridge 
sequence between them, it's very easy to watch a single story or two and then walk away, go to sleep, whatever, and just come back and finish it later. It's excellent. It's well worth checking out if you're looking for some spooky flicks to watch as October approaches. A, I think the last I checked, it was actually available on Internet Archive. I know there's a Criterion Blu-ray of it. I love the movie. It's it's spectacular. It's super atmospheric. It's got some really great visuals. Not in terms of like the brightness of it, but the usage of colors and the like way the technicolor of it kind of comes across. It's like one of the most visually striking and just like beautiful movies. It's got like a painterly feel to like the whole thing. I love it. Nice. And also I'm going to get my Godzilla quota in here. Hideo Amamoto is in Godzilla's Revenge, which is a criminally underrated Toho Godzilla film. It was made for one of their Matsuri festivals on a budget of, like, the money they found in the consoles of their cars and a timeline of quite literally a few weeks. I think the entire thing, I may be slightly misremembering this, but the entire thing went from hey, you have to make us a Godzilla movie, which wasn't written yet, to through script, through filming, in the can, and in theaters in two and a half months. Wow. <laughs> that That is mind-blowing how fast that is. Now, it's it's considered one of the worst Godzilla movies because it has tons of stock footage. But if you just contextualize the timeline, the budget and it playing at a Matsuri festival rather than receiving actual nationwide theatrical distribution, which we've talked about these Matsuri films and what they are. They're just commercials for your own product. Plus, contextualize, it's a movie meant for young, young children. It's a lot better than its reputation. I did a whole commentary podcast for it on Kaiju Transmissions, a friend of the show, a few years back. Check that out to hear me fawn over it more. It's like they're I think it's like their seventh episode or something of their podcast. And then also like episode 195 of their show has a 50th anniversary retrospective from Steve Rifle and Ed Gajaszewski, who are the co-authors of Ashira Honda's biography. It really puts into context just how little those filmmakers had to work with on all fronts when putting that movie together. It was like I mentioned, it was just insane. They, we're told in like mid September to write a script and the movie had to be done before the end of November. Good Lord. That's I, bonkers. That's bonkers. <laughs> so yeah, I just had to get that. I had to get my Godzilla quota in. Also, if anybody wants to let us know if we miss an episode where he doesn't get a Godzilla reference in, please let us know so <laughs> that I can torture him for it. Getting back to our, our notes here. Uh, there's also a lot of visual inspiration taken from Christopher Lee's Fu Manchu character, which is obviously a whole can of worms with yellow face and also the general yellow peril problems that literary character represents as well. But uh, Lee played the character five times from 1965 through 1969, and the final film, The Castle of Fu Manchu, is a Joel episode of MST3K. Though the movie comes along fairly early in the show's history, in the third season, the crew uh, comment that it might be the worst one that they've ever had to do. <laughs> so it's only like the third season, but they do say, whoa, this is like the worst one yet. <laughs> it's, it's a great bar to to be able to get over, I guess. He's also inspired by the real life bird, which is known as the red crowned crane of northeast China and Japan. Uh, it's associated with Taoist mystics because of its appearance. So like his his hat has that little like red fleck on the top there. It's but it's like modeled to look as much like the bird as possible. Mm -hmm. In Chinese, this crane is called a da ding he. I hope I said that right. The don, which means red, comes from the word dan sha, which is a mercurial mixture smelted in Taoist crucibles that can grant immortality to senin, and is also the same don as in danitan which is the internal lower abdomen where supernormal abilities are cultivated and refined, like an inner, inner crucible of the body, if you will. The reason why Senen, or in Chinese culture, Xianren, uh, become associated with these red crown cranes is that a red crown on a Senen denotes that the Dansha, their immortality mixture, has ascended from the Danatan, their abdomen, and they have attained immortality. 
Therefore, because these cranes have red crowns, they are also seen as immortal. And in truth, their lifespan averages about 60 years. So you could imagine a person of, uh, I will say, a less science-driven background believing one of these birds to be immortal if they keep seeing the same one for decades. Uh, the metaphor of cranes as immortal senin mixes so well that not only do senin come to be thought of as crane-like, but the cranes wind up being called the hermit cranes because they're seen to be so much like senin. Uh, That's Toriyama, not confusing at all. <laughs> no, not not even a little bit. I'm surprised I got through that without tripping up on it. I do think, just to correct you slightly, I think it's Don Chan instead of Donatan. Ah, Don Chan. Okay, I'm not sure. <laughs> That's possible. I could. I, I'm. I am not a. I am not an expert on Asian languages. One of us is don't. wrong. Maybe. <laughs> may, <laughs> Probably maybe both. both of us. <laughs> yeah. Toriyama himself admits that he doesn't consciously know all this. Uh, when asked why he places a crane to face turtles, he says, there's no great reason. I thought, if not turtles, how about cranes? These symbols are so commonplace in Eastern culture that Toriyama isn't even aware he's doing this thing. Maybe the best analog I can think of is calling the villainous organization of G.I. Joe Cobra. The creators might think of no reason other than it sounded cool. And that may well be the intent, but Western culture has a whole, like, tends to be very steeped in Judeo-Christianity, and the first form the devil took takes on the, the form of a serpent. So snakes are culturally thought of as enemies in Western culture, hence cobra. Uh, there's a Japanese idiom spoken in uh, spoken to newlyweds that translates to crane for a thousand years, turtle for ten thousand, which simply means basically happily ever after. Uh, and it's wishing the couple you know eternal happiness and health. So just from everyday life, Toriyama learns that cranes and turtles kind of go together. Then the next logical question becomes, why make them rivals if traditionally they're both seen as positive images? For that, just look at turtles and compare them to cranes. They inhabit the same ecosystems, but they could not be more different. One is a biological tank that could live its entire life mostly in one place, and the other is a graceful, elegant, active creature. Yeah, so it just makes sense to – it's a, it's a weird thing where it makes sense to put them against each other just if you – Look at a turtle and a crane. Right. And then it also makes sense culturally, even though it kind of doesn't. They're they're both usually seen as good omens, and the crane hermit is... Yeah, he's... I mean, he's evil. We end up finding out... Do we find that out next time that his brother was Tao Pai Pai? Yeah, that'll be, that'll be our next episode, I think. Yeah, so... You know, we find out that this guy's brother is the world's greatest assassin, and, you know, he's training Tien and, and, and Chao Tzu, who are less than scrupulous. In, is that the word? Yeah, yeah, that, that's a good yeah. word for it. They're, they're not the nicest guys. Uh, so so it's, it's a weird thing in that respect, but, you know, cr- cranes and turtles – have at least been culturally paired with each other for for centuries and so then toriyama just he just kind of knows that right like like we said yeah i do think the cobra thing i can't think of any other like good real good examples i think probably just how casually we tend to put rats in things as scary or spiders or snakes yeah like we just do it casually rats especially are often seen as like a like a scary thing or a gross thing in movies or Definitely. storytelling and that goes yeah that goes back to like the plague my my thought also and and this is less having to do with animals but i think it still is very culturally rooted is when you look at like american action films from the 80s the preponderance of enemies or villains in those movies were usually either Russian or some variation of Middle Eastern. <laughs> Very true. Yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there's any examples that I could think of of things that historically, culturally have gone together and then they're placed at odds with each other. I can think of plenty of examples of like the opposite happening, like the uh, fox and the hound. Reese's uh, cups uh, tried to do that with peanut butter and chocolate. They tried to pretend like they're not supposed to go together when it's pretty obvious that they do. 
You got chocolate in my peanut butter. You got peanut butter in my chocolate. Why are you people complaining? <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, like I, I could definitely think, you know, like the, there's like the fox and the hound. Any movie that has cats and dogs in it always, not always, but like usually has the cats and the dogs. There, and wasn't up- there, wasn't there a series of movies that was specifically about cat, cats versus dogs? Yeah. <laughs> but there's like the secret life of pets i think like ultimately has like cats and dogs working together homeward yeah, bound homeward bound has like the cat looking down on the two dogs throughout the movie and then they you know bond over what they go through so there's plenty of examples of the opposite that i can think of of taking two cultural enemies and putting them together i'm trying to think of like two cultural buddies and putting them together Hmm. I, or and not putting them together, but putting them at odds with each other. That almost yeah, just I, that almost just seems more like doing a thing where I hate to even give this movie an an inadvertent rub, but <laughs> where where you would have Batman fight Superman. Oh yeah, okay. There's one. Or um, uh, that brings up. That that brings up uh, Marvel Civil War. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A, a, I mentioned this as a really good example of this being done in comic storytelling. I think Greg Rucka's run on Wonder Woman. He has a story called the Hikatea, which is like a kind of standalone little story that focuses on this woman coming to seek sanctuary from Wonder Woman for killing someone and batman is like on her case for for killing someone and when wonder woman is like well if i'm gonna do this i need to know like why did you do what you did and she explains that it's because her sister was captured not captured but like kind of seduced by lowlifes who preyed upon her wanting to be an actress and you could imagine then what they would make what low life's preying upon a wannabe actress oh, okay. would, would make her into and how she would ultimately descend into a world of drugs and ultimately her own demise and she like explains that to wonder woman and wonder woman's like oh yes i will like i will protect you and so batman comes and he's like she's a murderer and wonder woman's like i'm honor bound by this thing that's called like the hikatea to protect her she has asked me for sanctuary and i cannot give her up it's like it is our greek goddess culture you know and batman and wonder woman then fight each other and it's really good (laughs) but yeah those are two typically historically on the same side of the law who wind up fighting each other yeah it doesn't happen very often really it happens i can think of it happens more in that kind of a case right i can't think of I can't think of things where it's like, oh, the the sun and the stars. Eh, I don't know. But like the the sun and is usually seen as like a positive thing, and mm-hmm. so is a rainbow. And we had a character who looks like the sun fight a character who looks like the rainbow, like because <laughs> that's what. This... Well, hopefully, it would be visually pretty. <laughs> but that's what this kind of is, you know. It's. Yeah, it's uh, like cranes and turtles are a little more esoteric than Batman and Wonder Woman. They're they're more well, general from our perspective, at least. Right. Sure. They're more general <laughs> ideas that end up kind of coming into conflict because Akira Toriyama is like, I don't know. He's like up against a deadline. <laughs> it's like, I don't know if I did some turtles. How about some birds? <laughs> He's like maybe, maybe he wrote this chapter shortly after being married and being told that idiom over and over and over again. <laughs> he's like um he's like Master Betty in Kung Pao. <laughs> he's like turtle turtle bird 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 bird. <laughs> uh no, I think this this stuff, a lot of this stuff and um what is it? There's there was I think I might have a note about it 
uh, for one of our future episodes, but I might as well say it now. And if we repeat ourselves, oh, well, a lot of this stuff was written around the same time as he was welcoming a young son into the world. Like his son by this point was only a couple of months old, I think. And he was also working on all of those little, uh, I think they're called Yomi Curry manga. I might be way wrong, but it's those one shot manga that, that Shonen Jump was like kind of forcing him to do. And then he was also working on Dragon Quest as doing a, as doing character designs. And so he ends up dropping into the background of the manga for sure. And I'm not sure how much the anime, a whole bunch of Dragon Quest characters and character designs. And oh. I think it's in no small part because he was like running up against de- deadlines and had to fill up these backgrounds. And usually he likes to drop in just fun little things that he likes, right? We saw in the in the 21st Tenkaichi Budokai, he dropped in like Superman and yeah. Dracula and uh, references to like his art supplies. Yeah. <laughs> you could tell he was looking at his desk going, I got to come up with something. Like, what do we and, do? and I think this time he was probably like, I got to come up with something and I got about five minutes. I got this character that I already drew. Let me just draw him right into there. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm what, see me personally. I think it was the hat is really what he just wanted to put a goofy hat on somebody. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, as we kind of round this out, this is our kickoff to the 22nd, but Tenkaichi Budokai or Budokai Tenkaichi. I mentioned on our, I think on our last episode, like, every saga from now to the end of the original run of Dragon Ball, to me, gets better and better. Yeah. But also, I remember specifics about them along the way less and less. Right. (laughs) I was thinking the same thing, actually. Because I agree with you. I think this this is a point in the story where he really starts to hit the gas and start thinking outside the box and doing some really crazy stuff. He's hitting a point now where his art's evolving and it's it's we're going to probably especially notice it in the the manga with it becoming like you said more angular. He's going to figure out more how he wants to convey action and he seems more focused on how he conveys that action now as opposed to like necessarily coming up with with jokes like he still comes up with jokes but you can tell that he's putting a lot more thought into like his his fight choreography yeah yeah and yeah it's just i remember very few specifics like i didn't remember any of the preliminaries to this tournament at all well so like this is probably my favorite tenkaichi tournament and i had completely forgotten about wolfman (laughs) and i completely forgot about the other muay thai guy whose name i've already forgotten (laughs) <laughs> and then uh the further we go the less i remember too like i know there's still another tournament arc left within dragon ball right are there do we even see preliminaries at all during that tournament <sighs> i mean off the top <laughs> of my head i can't even remember you're right because i want to say we don't and i want to say this is the last time we see it and i Kind of hope it is, because what I'll say is I think this is the last time you can conceivably trick people a little bit into thinking that they might some of our main limits. characters will not make it past the preliminaries. Which would probably have worked better if that had happened in the first tournament that we saw. Maybe, yeah. But but you I mean, can at least build the... You can build a little bit of suspense, you know. Sure, yeah. Especially, no, but, but... especially the Goku thing. Goku, you know, taking down this Chapa O, who's a previous tournament winner that has never been touched. I mean, you could you could have thought, oh, this will be a good preliminary fight at least, and then no, it's just over like immediately. <laughs> Yeah, like I thought it was going to be because I totally had forgotten about the fight. Like that's how quickly it's over. But I thought it was like, oh, yeah, this might actually be a decent fight. And I actually got suckered into it again just from how he set it up. Mm-hmm. And then once the fight starts and I realize, oh, right, this is where he just like clowns and completely destroys the guy without even trying. 
Yeah. There's a moment to... I can't remember if it's now or when Goku faces his next opponent. There's a moment coming up with Krillin. Krillin has like a little line of dialogue somewhere in here where he is kind of stunned that a char- like a, a person that Goku fought it was so weak or something. It might even be the person he it might even be his Anton the Great thing. Uh, and he's like, God, that was like so easy. You know, the, the quality of the competition has gone way, way down. And that's just like a great little Krillin moment because even when he does something, he thinks that like the only way he could beat someone is because they must have been bad. <laughs> That's kind of my my uh, outlook on life too, honestly. <laughs> and and I I like Krillin. That's that's just all I, all I'm saying is I like Krillin. <laughs> it's at least an, uh, like he's he, it's it reveals his character a little bit that like he doesn't quite have as much confidence in himself as the others. And so yeah. his his victories instead of attributing them to his own hard work is like wow they just must have been really bad. Yes. <laughs> And so, yeah, heading into this, I remember really liking this this saga and this kind of being the one where I was like, oh, man, I love when they do these tournaments. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember how much of a jerk Tien is. You know, that's the, been the biggest surprise <laughs> yeah. through watching these these early episodes in this tournament is I was like, oh, yeah, he's like. Same with Chaozu, too, even. I was a little surprised with how much of a jerk he just is for no reason. Yeah, because I, like, kind of... I could understand him being like, and like antagonistic towards Goku because they've at least run into each other before. But he decides to just hone in completely on Krillin, who has done nothing to. Him. <laughs> There's some great though back and forth between those two characters. Mm-hmm. You know, like picking on Krillin for not having any hair, and then Krillin being like, "You're bald too," also and him bald. being like, "It's like ah, not technically. I have <laughs> <He's>... one." <laughs> And he's like, how is having one hair better than being bald? And then Chaozu's just like, are you jealous? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's, I mean, there is some good, like, banter between our our foes here. I, I like that. And, yeah, I remember really liking this. And I'm I'm hoping that bears out as we do the, the research and, and figure out. I'm sure... I feel like it has happened with almost all of these as we've done like the research and read about these characters more. It just makes me like all this stuff more. Yeah, definitely. I am hoping that continues and I'm like excited for that. I'm excited to like learn about Tien and Chaozu and how those two are considered humans. And, and I'm also like a little disappointed that they weren't used more later on in the series because they are legitimately good characters. Yeah. But you know, that's Toriyama. If you want something, yeah. he will not do it. That's true. That is true. <laughs> so I guess the secret is we just have everyone go, no, we don't want more Tien Shin Han. We just, we don't want him. <laughs> keep him, keep him out of our dragon ball. This guy sucks. <laughs> But yeah, I'm looking forward to this this saga and the rest of it. And then uh, I don't know—is that anything else you need to say about Suru Senen before we wrap it up for the day? Man's got great drip. That's all I'll say. <laughs> I haven't seen any of those uh, Christopher Lee Fu Manchu movies. <laughs> I, I kind of don't want to. <laughs> I know that like that the general. The general st- – like, they're super – like, that's a super popular thing. I don't know a ton about it. I don't even know about popular because it's certainly not popular anymore. But I know it is, like, very culturally impactful because future characters who s- even kind of sort of follow that mold end up being called Fu Manchu-type characters. Like, the main example I could think of is the Mandarin. Yeah. Like – Everyone's like, yeah, the Mandarin is like, you can't do the Mandarin anymore because he's a Fu Manchu yellow peril character. And yeah. you're like, Fu Manchu, that's that mustache, right? And then you realize that it's the mustache. Be- that's the other thing. It's mm-hmm. mustache because the character. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so 
all I know is that Fu Manchu is like impactful as a literary character. And then there are also these movies that I haven't seen. I might watch the MST3K episode. I think that's probably about as far as I would take it. <laughs> I wonder if like the first one's actually good. It got four I, sequels. I maybe I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll maybe we'll save that for one of our uh, commentaries. <laughs> oh yeah, we could do that. <laughs> do a whole commentary on Yellow Face. Oof. <laughs> So, any good potential waypoints for our next target? Uh, a few pings, but no particularly exciting targets. What about this one? That's admittedly a strong power reading from two potential warriors on one planet, instead of just one, uh, but it's pretty far away. Yeah, but look, a third point is actually headed their way. That means by the time we get there, there could be three potential recruits. You know, if we get more than two at once, we get to claim overcapacitance and head home for a week, right? A chance to check in on my people? Yeah, maybe see your sweetie? Uh, my species has a strong distaste for all things sweet. That explains your immunity to my charms. <sighs> yeah, that explains it. Anyway, look, we'll head towards that unnamed, uncharted planet way out there, outside Frieza-controlled space, in the Gamma Quadrant of Sector 4. Along the way, we can hit the points here, here, and here at Zeti 3, P32, and Cygnus 5. It'll take us a little longer to get there, but that'll give those three warriors plenty of time to get acquainted. That sounds like a decent plan, and most shocking of all, it came from you. Well, with that bit of insolence, we'll take our leave of you here, listeners. Will we reach our uncharted planet unscathed? Will we find new and exciting recruits on new and exciting planets along the way? Find out next time and help us achieve our final forum. Final Form is written and produced by Tom Gwelly. It is performed by Dan Kinney and Tom Gwelly. Our webmaster is Dan Kinney. Our theme music is provided by YouTube content creator GVG Kit. Want to learn more about the Dragon Ball universe, including concept art, behind-the-scenes interviews, and recommendations from Jelly and Bikini? Connect with us on social media. Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at Final Forum Pod. Make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you receive your podcasts. And of course, make sure to share with your friends and family and help us spread the word of the glory of Lord Frieza. The Frieza Force thanks you for your listenership. 